first of all, thank you very much for joining us, Eric. Uh, so for those who maybe don't recognize you uh, on site, you are Eric Lang, a game designer of uh, numerous titles, including some of the ones appearing behind you right now. Uh, Canadian well, game are. designer. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you very much for taking some time to just chat with us oh, and thank talk you for about me. the the industry and your experience with it and your process and all that. So uh, process, which is how you know it's a Canadian interview. So let's start with some easy questions. Uh, what is your personal favorite type of game to play? What do you enjoy? I like ESP games. I like games where knowing your opponent, what's going on in your opponent's head, is the primary uh, is the primary skill set of the game. I like games where uh, that are psychological, that are uh, emotion, like in that way, emotionally gratifying, uh, and where the character of the game changes completely depending on which players you're playing at the table. So stuff like Resistance and love uh, that Shadows Over Camelot, Battlestar Galactica. Um, uh, I mean, I also, a uh, Cosmic Encounter, like, uh, I'm the boss, Sid Saxon's I'm the boss, love that Great game. Great game, yeah. Now, uh, you and I, we have played games together in the past. We and, have, uh, and I believe I won all of them! Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, one of the things that you always say when we're looking at the wall and deciding what to play is you don't want to play any of your own games. And I'm just curious why that is. I hate my games. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm kidding, no. <laughs> so, no, um, uh, I play test my games twice a week. Uh, my wife and I run a, we run a very, very uh, strict scheduled play test gauntlet every Monday and every Thursday. I play my games more than any other games out there. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's not that I get sick of it, but I just, when there's a clear line of demarcation between just playing games for fun and right. playing games for work. And when I'm playing, especially we're playing at our mutual friend's house, I just want to, I want to turn that off. I want right. to turn the game designer off and just enjoy. I think that's important. Now, you have designed a lot of games. You, you have a lot of stuff on the market. There's some behind you here on the wall right now. Um, Arcadia Quest, Mystic, uh, you know, and this stuff and, and, and more. Uh, Dice Master. Dice Master, of course, a very successful uh, franchise. How many sets are out right now? Uh, there are four out right now, but I just finished designing set number nine. Right, so you've got lots of stuff under your belt. Do you have a favorite of your own? Is there, is there one of yours that you're just like, yeah, this is my baby, this is the great one? That one, one. no. <laughs> I actually like the game a lot. Um, so, I mean, of course all my games are my babies, but, uh, and there are games I like more than others, but it's, I think of it more in terms of what I'm obsessed with at any one given time. Uh, I am. Right, and it's, I mean, like with most designers, it's, my answer's pretty stock. It is what, uh, it's very heavily weighted to what I've, what I've been working on recently. So I, uh, I'm obsessed with Dice Masters as a player right now because there's so many sets, and uh, what we're, the Dice Masters we're playing is very different from what you guys are playing here. Uh, I have an a tra online trading card game called Duelist that I play a lot um, because it's part of our playtesting process, but I just, I play it for fun. I love it. Okay. Uh, now, XCOM is one of your more recent uh, releases. Yep. And I'm really bad at that. It's kind of um, taken the game world by storm a little bit because of the app integration with the board game. Uh, I've played it. I've enjoyed it. Uh, I understand why there might be people out there who have criticism uh, of it. Well, you can't play it in 500 years. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the, the big question that I've got for you is, uh, was the plan when you were you know given the the XCOM license to to run amok with was the plan always to do it as an app integrated board game or was that something that sort of hey wouldn't it be cool you know that came up during the development right no from day one day from one. Uh, the day that uh, I remember the day very very clearly uh, I have a meeting with FFG every year and they were like so these are the projects that we have right now. Uh, they mentioned a couple of things, including Star Wars, that I liked, but then they hit XCOM. I was like, I don't want to hear anything else. I want to do XCOM, because I love XCOM. Right. And they're like, all right. And we also talked about many years, for many years, about wanting to do a game with an app, and uh, with app integration uh, in a particular way. And we like, and they said, this should be the game. And I was 100% agree. And so there was no version of XCOM in any point of the design that was even played without an app. So I actually did a very basic wireframe for the app before touching the first prototype. Do you think that a lot more games are going to take their cue from 
the current wave of, of app oh, yeah. integration, and, and we're going to see a lot more of that, you think? I do, absolutely. I, I'm working on three of them right now. Uh, it's, I mean, the, every app, there's many games that are doing it differently, that are, they're do, integrating the app for different reasons, and uh, my reasons are always going to be a, broadly the same. Uh, I'm not really so much interested in games that, uh, that could just be a computer game or that bring a digital gimmick, I guess, to it, or graphical enhancement. That's not really what I'm into. Those will be there and they'll be successful. But to me, uh, th this has to serve this. And board games are always about the, the social interaction, about me interacting with you, the ESP factor, all that stuff. The app has to be, what the app has to do is, uh, it has to enhance that and involve new, uh, give, provide us with new ways to interact with each other or to purify that interaction by taking away some of the administration or uh, distracting elements of the game. Or of course, even just to teach. Do you pitch? games to companies or more often is it the companies contact you and say we're interested in blank game do you want to design it for us or does both happen it's a, both do happen um, it used to be actually up until last year it used to be most of the time companies would come to me and say like we would like we'd like to commission x game we have x license uh, because that's what i asked for i i went for a long period of time where the blank page was just not something I was interested in. I wanted to, I wanted to have restrictions on everything I worked with, and I, I was really into licenses. There were so many licenses I'm a fan of that I want to work on. Uh, it's recently starting to uh, come full circle again. I'm now starting to make more games on my own and pitching them out because I don't fear the blank page anymore, and I want to make more quirky games. Okay. Now. There's a phrase in the board game industry, elegant design. Elegant um, design. Are there any games out there that you look at and you think, oh, that is, that's an amazing design. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe I wish I'd designed that. Oh, yeah, and, and what does the phrase elegant design mean to you? Uh, elegant design. So that means I have to come up with an elegant way of phrasing it. So, uh, so to me, elegance is solving many problems with one solution. Uh, that's the, in, from the designer speak. So I like games that express a complex idea very, very, very simply and that reveal their depth over time. Uh, so we talked about before, just Sid Saxon's I'm the Boss. Mm -hmm. I, when I saw that game, when I just saw how much of that game springs out of the, bo like springs out of the box and is not contained anywhere in the rules, mm -hmm. it's a game that feels like it would play differently with group, from group to group, and it does, but the general patterns emerge and it's so, the emerging gameplay is so amazing, I love it. Um, so I love, to me that is, uh, that any game Sid Saxon designed, I'm a Sid Saxon fanboy. Uh, Magic the Gathering is, it's a complicated game, but it's an incredibly elegant game. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm a game designer right now. It's just two wizards summoning creatures to kill each other. Conceptually super simple. Yeah. Uh, a lexicon of game rules that are thousands of pages long. <laughs> uh, I love that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you sometimes work with other designers. You sometimes work solo. Do you have a, a preference? Uh, right now, I'm enjoying my collaborations a little bit more. Um, I, I, I mean, it's really close. It's 5149, right? So, uh, there are, I'm working with many different designers on many different games, and I enjoy each one tremendously, all for different reasons. But uh, there, it's more work, at, honestly, to work with another designer than it is to work by myself. But the, I learned something. Well, I learn a lot of things from each designer for uh, and our styles do kind of inform each other a little bit, and I feel like we both of us come away with a little, a little more, a few more chops than we had before, or at least you know stealing a little bit from the other guy. <laughs> uh, why would you say it's more work to work with someone else? I mean, yeah. well, so you'd think it was 50-50, right? I do 50, you do 50, yeah. but it's not. It's more like I do 80 percent, you do 80 percent, and we the rest is compromised. Right. So, uh, and I work with a lot of like got designers I think are better than me or at least smarter than me and we like we have a lot of pride and passion in our work and a lot of opinions so there's a lot of negotiation a lot of um, we spend a lot of time trying to find common ground and the that does take a lot of work um, but it's worth it now uh, you 
and I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, play tested a game that you're working on with Bruno. With Sai Bruno, yep. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk about that or if it's sort of in the hush hush development stages. Uh, sure. Well, we are, so this is, this is one of those blank page games that uh, Bruno and I came together. Uh, Bruno and I have a tradition now for the last few years where he and I will uh, meet at Essen, the big German game convention. Um, at, we'll meet at the bar on Thursday night. We'll have exactly two glasses of wine, and we'll talk about games, and a game just comes out of it. Like, so far, this happened three years in a row. This is the second of those games. Uh, it's called uh, Which Side Are You On? It is, as Bruno calls it, a dysfunctional social game. Dysfunctional family game is what he calls it. Uh, a game about lying to your friends. Uh, both two players are on hidden. There's up four to eight players. Each one's on a different team with some outcasts for spice and you have to throw around victory points for the right team and before you get swapped and all that zany Bruno type stuff. But um, it's the second game. We actually have one game that we did a year and a half ago called uh, Need, which is being published by uh, Louis Mem, uh, one of the satellite uh, publishers with Asmodee. Mm. That's coming out next year. But the games that we do together are very much the games I was talking about before, games about bluffing, right. ESP, and like a lot the of this, kind. right? Yeah. All right, cool. Many designers um, focus on making thematic ga games, whereas others are more about abstract stuff. They just want good mechanics. When you're working on a project, is it, uh, do you find, anyway, for you, is it theme first, theme driven? Like, here's XCOM, what are you gonna do with it? Or is it more, ooh, I have this idea of, you know, a time management, I've got, I've got a, a mechanic that you want to apply to a game. What, what comes first for you? Um, it's a good question. It's not, it's never one, right? It's, it's a little of this, little of that. So at the risk of redefining the question, um, I would say that generally what I look for is, I'll, I'll do a little creative brainstorming, but I always look for what I call the soul of a game. And the soul of a game is something that is, like, is either theme-oriented, vision-oriented, what I call it, or it's a gimmick, or it's a set of mechanics that come together to be a play pattern. But as, the soul of the game is what is the thing about a game that makes players care, that makes it not just a checklist of things that you have to accomplish. And so for me, the, uh, for example, the soul of the, the, the game for which side of you are you on, neither of us said, I've had this cool mechanic. Uh, we just said, like, what, what is the most dysfunctional game we could make about players being teammates together? And, or with XCOM, I, was, I said, I wanted to make a cooperative game where players violently disagree with each other as much as possible. So you could say that's mechanics oriented, but to me that's the part of the game that makes it unique and that makes players relate to it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Chaos Ball on the wall behind you there. Chaos uh, Ball! It's from Cool Mini or Not. You yeah. just did Blood Rage with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I believe you also did Arcadia Quest with them, yep. right? And they were all Kickstarter games. They were. Right? So you've had you've had some big successes with uh, with Kickstarter. Very now lucky. There, it's it's a controversial topic. Uh, fans out there, uh, there are those who say, "Yeah, let me see those big companies doing Kickstarter because I get a special version of that game before anyone else does." There are other people who say, "No, Kickstarter is not for the big dogs. It's for the underdogs. It's for the the guy in his garage who came up with an idea and needs the financing to to make it actually." happen as opposed to the companies that, well, we've already put this money into developing the game, now we're going to see how many people want it, kind of thing. Um, do you, as someone who's been on the other side of a Kickstarter campaign, do you have any uh, insights or any opinions about that? Uh, sure. I mean, I've, uh, I respect the opinion that, that the Kickstarter is, is supposed to be an indie playground or an indie proving ground, um, completely independent. but. Uh, I do maintain, having seen many Kickstarters, I've had friends that have run really little ones, and I've seen the big, I've been part of the really big ones. There's no mutual exclusivity there, right? The the, the Kickstarter, the pool of Kickstarter backers grows with every game that's released. There's, I've I've very very rarely seen, for example, an indie campaign where somebody's like, oh no, I just finished backing the latest Cool Mini or Not game, so I'm not going to back this, hmm. right? So, uh, I actually believe that the big game, the big companies. Uh, or the or the explosive games just they bring they feed the the ecosystem. Um, that's how it's beneficial for the whole. Selfishly, uh, I think that everybody there's no reason anybody should be denied the uh, 
like even if you have a budget, like even or the big guys like Will Wheaton or Zach Braff who wanted to do their movie, sure. right? It's to them, it's they want to do this idea that they feel needs to be proven to the market. Right, and so of course, like with Cool Mini or not, yes, they have the money, and there's no drama as to whether the game's going to get funded or not. But the real question is, does this game have legs on the retail level? So what we care about more is backers than dollar amounts. We don't want to suck all the dollars out of uh, a few fans. We want to get lots of people interested and seed the market with it. Okay. Uh, now, obviously. A designer of a game wants the game to do well. You, you, you would like it to sell, because not only does that mean money for you, um, obviously depending on the contract, but it, it also just means your name is out there, your reputation is out there, uh, and there are way too many factors beyond just okay. is, the good, is the game good yeah. uh, that will determine whether or not it actually sells, whether it finds its place in the market. Do you have anything like that? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean... Um... So I, uh, I got a couple. I will say that Midgard uh, from Z-Man Games, which was the spiritual antecessor, maybe? Predecessor? Uh, predece oh my god. <laughs> the, the, yes, the pre <laughs> That's what happens when you try to get too fancy. Uh, the spiritual predecessor of uh, Blood Rage is also a Viking drafting game, but it was more of a Euro uh, area majority game. It was, it was kind of light and it was fast paced. I'm very proud of that game. Um, it died a bit of a production death, which was my fault. Uh, I mismarketed it, and the publisher gave me too much control, uh, and so there you go. Um, the uh, there's a game for Wiz Kids that came out two years ago that uh, I made a Hobbit game, unlike the other 75 guys that made one, and that's probably why it didn't do that well. So it, uh, it but it was a big box strategic, uh, like two hour gamery Hobbit game. It was very different from all the other very light family oriented ones. I thought the game was very good and it was very immersive and all that stuff, but of course it came out at the same time as a million other games. It didn't really get a chance. Now, conversely, do you have any titles that made it to market? I mean, every designer has games that never make it past the, the playtesting and the prototyping stage. You just you, Absolutely. You give up on it. But do you have anything that actually made it to market that you look at and you think, oh, I. I could have done better. I wish I'd had more oh, yeah. time or, or whatever. Do you have anything that, that you can, you know? Yeah, a lot. Um, the one I always point to, though, is I don't know if anybody even knows this. I did a uh, Dragon Ball Z board game way back when, 2004, 2005, I think it was, uh, co designed with uh, Daryl Hardy at FFG. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time uh, to make that game. We got the license, we had to uh, push out quickly. But, uh, and neither of us were fans of the series, I mean, to be frank. But, we used the fact that we used our time constraint as an excuse to just kind of push out a game. And the game wasn't broken, it wasn't terrible, it just wasn't, it wasn't there, it wasn't 100%. And that game still keeps me up at night. I still wish I'd done a better job with that game because it's a huge license for a lot of kids that are really into gaming. Um, and a lot of them liked it well enough, but it could have really, it could have been the game that did for them, like you know, Dungeons and Dragons did for me, or. Right. Stuff like that it could have been a real strong gateway game. Okay. Uh, in recent times, um, the whole Gamergate thing has been uh, just tearing apart the video game industry. Hashtag uh, lame. And, yeah, and uh, whichever side you're on, uh, there's no doubt that it has been destructive and it has had a, a, a bad uh, effect on on video games, video game fans, uh, and, and everybody. It's been divisive. Uh, it's been very divisive. And uh, we don't see the same sort of thing in the board game industry, but there still is a definite uh, perception that board games are for boys, mm -hmm. that, that it is a, a very male-centric hobby, male designers, male, pub male driven publishing companies, male fans, and all of that. Now, I can speak from experience here at the cafe that our customer base is definitely half female. Um, you know, the population is half female, our population is half female. There's no reason uh, that women shouldn't be involved in gaming, but that perception lingers. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't that many female designers, but they're, they're there, they, mm -hmm. they are out there, and many of them are winning awards and doing great work. Um, as someone in the industry, um, do you see this, the divide between men and women, and do you think it's the industry's duty to be more 
um, inclusive, or are we just sort of naturally headed in that direction anyway? What, what, what do you think? Uh, it's a really good series of questions. I think uh, I think we are we are getting better. Um, we're getting more inclusive, and we are naturally heading that way. But that I mean, you know, the the wow to rip off much smarter man than I. Like right? the, the the price of inclusiveness is eternal vigilance, right? Um, and we have to. Con we have to just get better, we, just, we have to. Uh, you said it really well, right? Half the population is female. There's nothing about games intrinsically that makes males, that appeals to males more than females, right? Games are just, they are a social covenant in a safe place that appeals to everybody, right? So uh, the only things that we can do, in my opinion, are just concentrate, spend our effort, don't concentrate on making girls games, because that's dumb, but, uh, making uh, We have quite a few here at the cafe, and right. yeah, the, they're not good. They're there not there good. you go, right? Like, uh, just concentrate on making games. Just concentrate on not alienating anybody, right? If you can, right? Some, of course, you'll, some themes will alienate people, but try not to consciously alienate people, or even, I guess, unconsciously. So, for example, right? Uh, we can our games could always do with less misogyny. They could do with less chauvinism. They could do with. Um, Right, there's, there's a great, uh, somebody, it was an artist friend of mine who put it very, very well. Uh, there's the difference between objectification and, uh, and uh, not idolization, but um, uh, I apologize, I'm forgetting, the, it was objectification versus idealization, thank you. Uh, where like everybody's, everybody can relate to idealization, right? If you idealize, somebody who's idealized, somebody you wanna be, somebody who's objectified is somebody you wanna have, right? We can do, away with objectification, and it's all about where the power lies. So just make games that empower everybody, make games that don't demean anybody, that feel that make people feel powerless. Um, that sounds really simple to say. It's like, say, make games fun. Yeah. But as long as we're thinking about that while we're making games, uh, we absolutely can do that. Um, on the professional side, uh, I actually know very many female game designers that are, um, they're really smart. They're, most of them are heading, most of them are in the casual game space. The, slowly but surely as the uh, game, as a, like the core market, the stuff that I generally do, like games like this, as it starts to open up a little bit more, you'll start to see more female gamers in that space as well. But this area is kind of a, more of a boys club yeah. than anything else, right? And it. But like I would play this game, right? There's there's nothing gender. I don't think there's anything gender specific about Cthulhu. It's like he's awesome. He's got tentacles and it's scary and all that stuff. I think a game like that would be. If somebody told me that was designed by a woman, I'd be like, okay, sure. Uh, now I don't know if you've noticed, but you are a black man, <laughs> or so I've been told. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I, I can't possibly be the first person to tell you that. I, actually, you are, Steve. <laughs> you are. Um, I was just wondering, I, I have not seen uh, a lot of uh, black people in the industry. Uh, and Yeah, me neither. I am, I'm wondering if you have any insights on that. I mean, do you have anything, any sort of interesting stories about being a person of color in the game industry? Um, are there games out there that bother you uh, because of how they depict uh, people of color in things like there's the infamous ghettoopoly oh um, yeah yeah that, yeah, yeah. That I believe Hasbro <laughs> fought very very hard to get off the market just because it was it was deemed uh, offensive and condescending there there have been games in the 70s that are uh, I think there was one called Fight the Power or something like that. Sure. Where, where one player is whitey uh, and gets all the money at the start and the other player is playing as, as black people and is essentially being oppressed throughout the game. Um, you know, there's... Of where course, you can play black people. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, the colonist issue in Puerto Rico. Sure. Uh, and then on the flip side, there are games, I think, that try to take it very sensitively, like uh, Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, do you have any, any thoughts on? I don't really. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, I'm conscious. I've become more conscious about uh, race as an issue in recent years uh, because of the news and all that stuff. But I mean, I was raised Canadian in Mississauga where, where like the norm, it's such a melting pot that the, the norm is everybody is different. Right. So uh, I, I hadn't 
actually encountered real overt st things like racism or segregation or stuff like that until I was well into my 20s, right, until I was an adult. So I'm pretty sheltered in that regard. But uh, so like, and of course, I'm not really offended by any, like the, the colonist thing in Puerto Rico, I find hilarious, right? Because I don't think it's, they're not using it. They're not, it's not weaponized at all, right? It's, they're just, they're making a point. In fact, in Puerto Rico, they, I, uh, there's a this thing I do find funny is that they label all of the components. You have X number of tiles, X number of things, and X number of brown colonist tokens. It's the only token where they count out the where color. They highlight the color. And so to me, that's actually I find that really funny. I don't. I guess I could understand where some people would find that offensive, but I certainly don't. It's they're pointing out that that colonists were brown. That's just that's how it worked, and it's it's not a game where the the victory conditions are not about exploiting them. Uh, it's, it doesn't hit home. Now that's me, I have, I have definitely privileged when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I would love to see more, and I think it's the same issues with women, right? Just all we have to do is just be mindful to not alienate right. people, right? We just ignore, ignore the stereotypes, ignore the certain things from the 50s and 60s that we may have seen a lot of on TV. And we're get, I think we're getting better about that, but uh, we could continue to. Okay. So uh, a while ago, when you agreed to do this uh, interview with me, uh, I asked the internet to see if there were any questions uh -oh. that people uh, really wanted to, uh, to hear from you. Uh, and uh, so here we go. Here's the first one. Uh, people on Facebook really want to know what Eric Lang has uh, traditionally on Boxing Day for dinner. What do, you, what do you eat? What do I eat? This is Facebook, right? So of yeah. course they're asking food questions. Yeah. Uh, Boxing Day, uh, turkey. Turkey that I started on Christmas. Okay, all right. And, and ice cream. Also donuts. Okay. They also wanted to know whether you are more excited about uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, uh, which by the time we actually shot this interview had opened, mm -hmm. uh, or Star Wars Episode Seven, which of course won't be till later in the no, year. No, that's a question. So, <laughs> so there we go. What, what excites you more? Uh, I guess possibly personally, but also maybe from a designer standpoint as well, so, you know. Your favorite candy, your favorite ice cream, go. <laughs> um, I am marginally more excited about Star Wars. I'm, uh, I think it's no secret that I'm a slightly bigger fan, of Star Wars fan than I'm a Marvel fan. Um, I, I've become, I was a Marvel fan in my 20s, I read the comics and then kind of got out of it, but then the movies brought me right back. Um, I loved, I love the Marvel movies. I love the heck out of them. So every Marvel movie that comes out, I'm excited about. There are so many Marvel movies that it's, the, you know, in aggregate, my excitement has right. to be spread out. Right. Uh, Each Star individual Wars. one gets less. It, yeah, a little bit, right? And, I mean, I love the Avengers one so much. It's awesome. Um, and, uh, and the new Dice Masters Age of Ultron expansion will be coming out soon. Um, <laughs> Which expansion set is that? Is that number nine or is that number oh five, six? Uh, yeah, five. Five, okay. If I'm wrong, the internet will tell you. Right. Um, the, uh, and Star Wars. So Star Wars is, I mean, it's the event, right? It's, I, I went to see Star Wars with my dad. I would, uh, you know, I see it with my nephew. We're going to see it with our kids. It's, it is, in my opinion, it is going to be the single biggest media event of all time. It's going to be bigger than MASH, bigger than Nixon, bigger than all the you know other such entertaining things about flying things in tears. Um, but the, the thing that excites me most about it is that it's the first new Star Wars. We, the first time, nobody knows what's going to happen, right? It's right. It, like, I feel like I'm 10 again. Right, I, that's the first time I watched Return of the Jedi. I was like, "What's this? What's gonna happen? Are there gonna be little fuzzy bears like fighting fuzzy carpets and giant?" Anyway, <laughs> so like, I am really, I, I'm just, I'm really jazzed about it, and I'm so jazzed about it that I'm expecting to be disappointed. But we've all, I think, every Star Wars fan has felt that particular mix of feelings. Of course, of course. And the thing is, I mean, to circle back to gaming, I mean. Star Wars is going to, of course, it's going to launch like every toy in the universe is going to come out. It's going to be Star Wars themed. Uh, I've worked on a number of Star Wars games that are going to be uh, reinvigorated again. Uh, I'm super excited about the gaming potential of it. Uh, Star Wars is one of those licenses that 
you know, I've worked on, but I still haven't gotten out of my system. I still want to make more. Right. Do you think that there's going to be more of the LCG uh, incorporating the episode seven? Uh, I cannot say. Ah, you, you cannot confirm or deny. I cannot confirm or deny. All right, okay. What about, uh, do you think that a Star Wars version of Dice Master might happen? Because they've already done D&D, &D, so they're, 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 the Dice Master system is going beyond comic books. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that might happen? Or is that, that's you know, another, that's another. Sorry. Right? Yeah, no problem. Just the fact that you can't talk about it. Means I can't talk about it. Means you can't talk about it, exactly. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Appreciate Steve. Appreciate the time. And uh, good luck with your future games. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing more from Eric Lang. Me too. <laughs> Goodbye, fourth wall.